All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm Jonathan Osses with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, I'm going to give you a broad overview of emerald ash borer, the biology, um, early detection, uh, the signs and symptoms to look for, kind of the distribution that's known in the state, and then Danielle will touch on regulations, and then we'll cover uh, your management options for dealing with it. And then uh, lastly, we'll cover uh, the best ways to report new infestations uh, that, that you may find around the state. So, um, started here. Uh, just a little bit. You really quick. Uh, yeah. If you have any questions, post them in the, there's a chat function in here as well. If you can post any of those right in there, if you have any questions, and I'll follow up with some links, the information that's shared, I'll put links directly in the chat as well. Sorry. So, uh, we're just going to start out with a little bit of background on, on the insect. Um, so, it's a metallic wood boring beetle. Uh, it's native to uh, northeastern Asia, so parts of uh, China, the Russian Far East, uh, Mongolia, the North and South Korea, and parts of Japan and Taiwan. Uh, so, it's, it likely arrived in North America sometime in the earlier mid 90s. Uh, the exact date is not known, but it likely arrived via solid wood packaging material. Uh, into the, the ports of Detroit, Michigan, and Windsor, Ontario. And so it, it wasn't uh, identified until 2002 in the Detroit, Michigan area. And at that point, uh, the population had built up and there were thousands of uh, ash trees dying around the metro area. And so lots of infested nursery stock and uh, uh, infested firewood got moved out of that area uh, to a new location. Uh, kind of kicking off that rapid spread of emerald ash borer throughout uh, North America. So at this point, it's now found in 37 um, states and five Canadian provinces. So it's throughout a good chunk uh, of the U.S. And uh, it was found in St. Paul, Minnesota in 2009. So we're now kind of getting close to year 15 of since we found emerald ash borer, and it's really starting to pop up a lot of places around the state. Um, we're now at uh, 46 counties with the addition of Morrison County, and so um, expect that to continue to increase as, as the years go by. And so we'll just talk a little bit about the life cycle so you understand how the, the insect biology works. All right, so we have, we kind of break it up into the emerald ash borer active period and the dormant period. And so the, the adult beetles are active May through September. That's what we call the flight period. And so this is the time you want to avoid doing work on ash trees if you can and avoid moving wood around long distances. Um, so the adult beetles uh, begin emerging uh, in the late spring or early summer. It kind of depends on how quickly things heat up in the spring. Uh, in general, in central Minnesota or probably, you know, Morrison County area, it's going to be right around that uh, the, the end of May or the first week of June that you probably reach initial emergence. So once those be beetles start to emerge from the trees, they will do a little bit of maturation feeding in the in the canopy of the tree. And they do that for a few days where they just nibble on the leaves. It's nothing that you would notice uh, with the naked eye. It doesn't do like what you would see with Japanese beetle where it skeletonizes the leaf. So they, they do a little bit of that maturation feeding. Uh, then they go find a mate and then they begin uh, mating and then they lay eggs uh, in the bark cracks and crevices. And they, they begin in the, the mid to upper canopy of a tree and then work their way down. So emerald ash borer infestations uh, always begin in the mid to upper canopy and then work their way down a tree so they can use up all of that available uh, phloem tissue uh, to really maximize the amount of uh, insects that can be uh, created from one, one infested tree. So once those eggs are laid, uh, within a week or two they hatch and then the larvae begin boring through uh, the bark and begin feeding in that cambium and that, that foam layer. So they disrupt the transport of water nutrients between the root system and the crown. That's what really does the damage to the trees. And so once they begin tunneling, they'll go through what we call larval instars. Basically, that's just growing sizes. Um, and so they go through these four larval instars before they then uh, chew a pupil chamber, which is what you can see in that center photo. And so at that point, it's done feeding and doing damage to the tree. Uh, it, it folds over into that, what you can see in that center, pic center picture, what we call a J larva. So at that point, it's done feeding. Uh, it'll overwinter that way. And then the next spring and summer when it heats up, it'll pupate. It'll turn into that adult beetle and start that process all over again. So um, it's important to 
know that we have both a one year and a two year life cycle in Minnesota. And the further north you go, the more two year life cycles we have. So just to give you an example of that, uh, emerald ash borer eggs that were laid in the summer of 2023, uh, they hatched, the larvae uh, started developing, it made it partway through its larval development before going dormant for the winter once it got cold. Uh, this next spring, summer of 2024, it'll continue, uh, continue its development and make its way to its pupil chamber. It will overwinter a second time and then in the summer of 2025, it'll emerge as an adult beetle. So this is important because you can have any immature uh, larval stage underneath the bark at any time of year. And so that, that's one of the reasons why it's so effective in, in being moved in firewood and things like that as well. Also note that uh, emerald ash borer, the, the adult females uh, can lay anywhere between 60 and 90 eggs. So you can see how that population really starts to increase rapidly. And the insects themselves aren't super strong flyers, but they can fly, you know, several miles on their own. Uh, but the average spread rate of the insect is about one to two miles a year. So um, that that is the life cycle of the insect. Um, and if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We can address them as we go along or uh, we can address them at the end. All right, so like I sort of mentioned just a bit ago is how emerald ash borer kills a tree. It's really that larval tunneling and that, that cambium layer that disrupts the flow of water nutrients between the root system and the crown that, that kills the tree. So uh, an ash tree can withstand a little bit of attack, but one, it's really once the numbers of emerald ash borer build up in a tree that it kills the tree. So um, as you can see in that picture on the left, there's just one uh, emerald ash borer gallery. But, you know, a few years later, uh, with a lot of eggs being laid, you then have thousands of emerald ash borer uh, potentially uh, emerging from a tree and you see it's gallery on top of gallery and the trees start to die rapidly. And so the real issue with emerald ash borer is that the, the populations, you know, they, they grow slowly at first, but once they kind of hit that exponential growth, you have this population explosion. And then within a couple years of that, you have uh, kind of mass tree mortality within a short period of time. So this is what uh, really uh, does damage and, and hurts city budgets. Uh, or And so it's, it's hard to deal with a lot of trees dying in that short amount of time. So uh, the earlier you find it and the earlier you can uh, start beginning management and sanitation uh, earlier on in the infestation that will impact uh, the way at, rate at which that grows uh, further years down the road. So uh, really early detection is key with this with this insect. So the host trees for emerald ash borer, uh, it's all true ash. So all, all fraxinous species. So they have opposite branching, they have compound leaves, and they have five to many leaflets. And they have kind of this diamond ridge bark that you can see on these this green ash pictured here. Um, so it's all true ash that are, are impacted by emerald ash borer. Mountain ash is not a true ash, so that's not something you have to worry, out, worry about. But uh, in Minnesota, we have three types of ash that are native. Uh, we have black ash throughout two thirds of the state. We have green ash that's found out throughout the entire state, and that's the most common tree you'll find in, in right of ways, uh, in landscaped areas, in windrows. Um, and then we, we do have pockets of white ash in the more upland areas and, and parts of the eastern part of the state. And so you can see with this little graphic that all three of these species are highly susceptible to emerald ash borer. And really there's about a 99% mortality rate. And so I'll talk about, about it a little bit later, but really the only way to protect individual trees is with insecticide treatment. All right, so how to recognize emerald ash borer, the ways to confirm an infestation. So basically it boils down to there's four ways to identify it. Uh, the number one way that uh, emerald ash borer is identified is by finding that S-shaped feeding gallery. So the, the insect leaves a distinct uh, tunneling pattern in ash. So it's the only insect in ash that will make that type of tunneling pattern. And as you can see in that picture in the top left, it has those kind of nice S shape, that tight serpentine back and forth. If you find that in an ash tree, you know you have emerald ash borer. It's the only insect that'll do that in ash. We have other native insects that'll do that in, say, birch trees, um, poplar trees, but if you find it in an ash, you know it's emerald ash borer. Next, we have uh, to the right is the emerald ash borer larva itself. So if you look where that uh, red circle is, uh, that is the tail end of the larva, and that what it's showing is the, the urogomphy. So it's what that is is the two little black pincers at the tail end of the larva. 
And so if you pull an insect larva out of an ash tree and it has two little spine like projections at the tail end, uh, you know it is an agrilus and you know it's emerald ash borer if it came from an ash tree. So that, that is distinct uh, for emerald ash borer if you pull it out of an ash tree. Next is the adult beetle itself. Um, it's about a half inch long by about an eighth inch wide, has those nice bright iridescent green wing covers and that uh, kind of bright magenta colored abdomen. Uh, emerald ash borer is typically up in the canopy of the tree. It's not, uh, you don't come into contact with it as, as often, but it does begin to happen as uh, populations uh, and pest pressure really starts to build in an area. So it, it, it is happening more and more, but it's not really the first thing you're gonna see. And you should be able to find uh, you know, evidence of the, the tunneling, the S-shaped feeding galleries before you ever uh, run into an adult beetle itself. And lastly, uh, they do leave a distinct D-shaped exit hole when exiting the tree. So it's kind of the shape of the head. It has a flat side. Um, these are, you know, like emerald ash borer itself, they're only about eighth inch wide, so they're really quite small. Uh, D-shaped exit holes are probably the worst thing to look for if you're trying to find it early. Um, you know, if you can see D-shaped exit holes at eye level, that means that tree is already pretty heavily infested, because like I mentioned before, emerald ash borer starts in the mid to upper canopy and works its way down a tree. So you want to be looking up for those initial signs of infestation. Um, but it is distinct, uh, and really what I'd recommend if you do find what looks like a D-shaped exit hole, uh, if you have permission to, to dig into the tree and look underneath that for that S-shaped feeding gallery, that is a much better way to, to identify it. All right. And then we also have, uh, you know, this nice handout that's available on our website as well, uh, or by request through our, rest of, our report of pest line. Uh, it just shows the insects that are commonly confused with emerald ash borer. So you can see in that top left picture, uh, top left of the picture circled in yellow is uh, emerald ash borer itself. And then uh, the most common insects that we get reported that are mistaken for emerald ash borer. And really the number one uh, report, misreport we get is the six spotted tiger beetle down in the bottom right. It's also kind of that bright iridescent green. People will see it run across their driveway, their deck, uh, things like that, and, and think they see emerald ash borer. But remember, emerald ash borer is typically uh, on the tree or up in the canopy, so. All right, so the signs and symptoms you wanna look for first to try to identify if there's something going on in your ash tree. Really, it's uh, it's woodpecker damage that we depend a lot on for identifying um, where emerald ash borer is spreading. So um, the once you get used to looking at it, they leave a pretty distinct look and so, as I mentioned, emerald ash borer starts uh, in that mid to upper canopy. Uh, emerald ash borer is typically laying its eggs uh, in those branches and stems between two to six inches in diameter, where that bark has transitioned from smooth to rough. And so that is likely where you're going to see that woodpecker damage occur first. And so oftentimes when the woodpecker is going after the larvae underneath the bark, uh, they will uh, slough off or fleck off uh, some of that outer bark, creating what we call blonding. And so as you can see in these, the, the pictures, there's these little blonde patches, and then you have these small dime size uh, oval shaped light colored holes that are just deep enough to get to the, the surface of the wood where that, that larva is. And so it leaves a pretty distinct look. We, um, we have other uh, insects that will bore into ash trees and woodpeckers will go after those as well, but oftentimes they're going deeper into the wood. So when woodpeckers go after them, it can create a somewhat of a shadow appearance. Um, sometimes you only see it at the base of the tree and you won't see anything in the, uh, the upper portions of the tree. And so that's another good sign that it might not be emerald ash borer because uh, it's always starting in the, the mid to upper canopy and working its way down. So you should have damage in both locations if you're seeing that. So here's some more uh, examples of what that looks like. You have a green ash on the, in that left hand picture there. You see those nice blonded areas and then you look closer and you have those shallow woodpeck holes uh, within those blonded areas. Um, and the center picture is is a black ash tree. Um, so unfortunately, with black ash, uh, the the contrast of that that bark flaking isn't quite as strong. So it's a little bit more faded, but it does in general the same thing. Uh, and then you can see a picture on the right is another green ash in a park that is heavily infested, where you can see that blonding all the way down the main um, stem of the tree, and then the bark is beginning to fall off, and th that tree is on its way out. And so other symptoms you might see as well are bark splits. So uh, when emerald ash borer initially attacks a tree, the tree will try to heal around that, that feeding gallery. 
And so it'll build up callus tissue trying to cordon off that wound. And as that tree continues to grow, uh, the, the bark will separate from the wood where that feeding gallery is and create a nice split in the bark where oftentimes you can see the S-shaped feeding gallery on the surface of the wood within that bark split. And so you can see two examples in those pictures right there. Uh, and then a couple more examples here is you can see that all going all the way up that main stem of the tree on the left. Um, and then if you look closely in that picture on the right at the top center, you can actually see uh, part of a split where you can see part of that feeding uh, gallery on the surface of the wood within that split. So it can be pretty sly looking. It, it's not very obvious all the time. And lastly, uh, canopy thinning. So, uh, you know, we tend to see woodpecker damage before we see any major canopy loss, uh, but canopy loss and thinning is, is what um, is definitely a symptom. So what you see is uh, fewer leaves, smaller leaves, a lot more light penetrating through. So it, it's much more thin on the outside and uh, a lot of times you'll see what in that picture on the right where it gets really thin in the crown and then you'll get a lot of epicormic sprouting along the main stem of the tree lower down in the canopy. So it gets really light and thin on the outside and real kind of thick and bushy uh, on the, in the inner part of that canopy. And so here's the general progression of symptoms. This is on average what we see. Uh, it can take a little bit longer or it can go faster if there is really high pest pressure in the area. So once an area is really heavily infested, uh, it might take less time than what's uh, on this table. But in general, uh, the kind of average progression is, you know, that first year of infestation, uh, there are no signs and symptoms in the tree that will let you know that that tree is infested with emerald ash borer. Uh, in that second year, you have more emerald ash borer building up in that tree. You may, uh, the woodpeckers may have found that food source in that second year with those large uh, larvae present. And you may have some woodpecking possible on, on a couple branches in the canopy. Um, you know, the winter time is the best time to look for this when the leaves are off the tree and you can see clearly up into the canopy. It also helps to have a nice pair of binoculars as well so you can see clearly. Um, and so, Really, if you know what to look for, it's typically in about that year three of infestation that you can spot the woodpecking, uh, the woodpecker damage uh, in the canopy of the tree because it's going to be on a number of branches, probably down the main stem. And you'll see a number of locations and you can probably uh, spot one of the S-shaped galleries in a, in a woodpecked area where enough bark has been knocked off to where you can see that feeding pattern. Um, you maybe have bark splits visible at that point. Um, you know, the, the canopy may start to be impacted in that year three, but it's not going to be very obvious to the average person. It's really in that year four of infestation that you start to see major canopy impacts and that the average person uh, would go, yeah, there's something wrong with that tree. And at that point, you're having more and more woodpecker damage throughout the canopy of the tree, maybe further down the trunk. And then years five and six, that tree is dying and on its way out. So, um, on average, it's about five to six years from initial infestation point to, to killing the tree. It's important to note that ash trees dry out very quickly and become hazardous quite quickly. So you really want to be dealing with trees before they're uh, completely dead, especially if they're located in your yard, next to your house, next to your garage, or uh, next to your neighbor's property. You want to deal with it before it become, gets that hazardous situation. Um, if it's you know located in an inconvenient location in your yard and it's a really large tree, it could cost a lot of money to take that out once it once it's completely dead because no one's going to climb that tree and they're going to have to bring in heavier uh, machinery to to actually get that out there. So you want to deal with it before the tree is completely dead. And I should mention that you know if you find it in that year two or three where that canopy is still healthy enough, uh, that you know insecticide treatment is still a potential option for protecting the tree at where it's at and and keeping it from getting infested further. And I'll talk about more more about that a little bit later. All right, so the distribution in Minnesota, um, like I mentioned, we're now at 46 counties with infestations. So here's a map uh, of where it's known to be in the state. So this is the Department of Agri Agriculture's uh, emerald ash borer status map. It, it shows kind of the generally infested areas and the counties with uh, quarantine restrictions. So this map is updated nightly. Um, so if you're ever wondering where emerald ash borer has been confirmed in the state, please uh, check with this map. And if you think you found it in an area that's not represented on the map, uh, please let us know and I'll, I'll let you mo know more about how to report those infestations to us in a bit. Um, so uh, 
why we're here today is due to the recent find in Morrison County. Um, and so I'll just explain a little bit more. So the, the counties in red there are the quarantine boundaries. So that's the, the boundaries for limiting the movement of any ash material or any hardwood firewood. And so, um, and then on there as well, we have the green polygons, which are the emerald ash borer generally infested areas. And so what that is, is a, um, a buffer around confirmed infested tree locations. Knowing that emerald ash borer is always further beyond what we can visibly see in an area. So like I was showing you with the symptom progression, you really don't see any symptoms in a tree until it's been in a tree for two to three years. Uh, emerald ash borer's average spread rate is, is you know, one or two miles a year. So it's always further beyond what you can visually see as far as damage in trees in an area. And so we put this buffer around confirmed infested trees to kind of better represent where emerald ash borer likely is. So if you're within a generally infested area, um, there's a good chance that emerald ash borer is already uh, infesting your ash tree, whether it shows symptoms or not. Uh, that's the, the best way to think about it. Um, and in general, if you're within, you know, at, at least 10, 10 miles of an infestation, you be, should begin preparing on uh, figuring out what you're going to do with the ash trees on, on the property that you manage. All right. So um, just zooming in a little bit further, it was found in two locations in Morrison County. So um, the initial detection was in the town of Genola, just south of Piers. It was found uh, in the in the city uh, city campground right there along Highway 25, um, and then it was found in kind of the uh, northwestern part of Little Falls, where I'll show you here when we zoom in just a second here. But as you can see, uh, it's been found in other areas, you know, within you know 25 miles or so uh, in St. Cloud and both the Stearns and Benton County side in the town of Malacca in Mille Lacs County then also found in the town of Albany along 94 in Stearns County and Sox Center. All right, so zooming in, uh, this is the area that was found in in Genola. So it was found just north of that 133rd Street right there. Uh, so you can see the town of Piers falls within the generally infested area. So um, if you're within that area, you should begin uh, deciding how you're gonna deal with your ash trees. And then if you go to Little Falls, it was found, uh, I believe, along Lindbergh Drive Northwest. So kind of right in the center of where that generally infested la uh, area label is located. It was found uh, kind of between 6th Avenue and 9th Avenue Northwest right there. You know, relatively early stages uh, from what we could see when surveying the area, um, but that's that's likely to expand in the near future. So um, if you're in, in that community, uh, be, start planning on what you're going to do with your ash trees now. All right, so now I'm going to have Danielle come up and talk about regulations. Hi, thanks for joining. Today I'm going to talk about some of the regulations. I'm the regulatory coordinator, so I oversee all of our wood movement quarantine stuff. So if you are in firewood, moving mulch, tree care, um, those kind of things, I'm the person to talk to about compliance. If you want to flip over, um, my contact information will be at the end as well. Again, um, so first, like quarantines, what are they? Why do we do them? Um, first, it's to reduce and eliminate the spread of a pest. So we put these areas in so it can allow us to reduce movement without um, any kind of mitigation. And then part of that allows us to facilitate businesses to work within these regulations. So there's not just that free movement, um, but I'm always happy to work with your business if you're in those tree care things to ensure you can continue business just to within those regs. Um, if you wanna flip over to the next one. In Minnesota, we do have two different kinds of quarantines. We have that internal and the external. So we're talking about an internal today with the addition of Morrison County. And then there's also an external. So draw a line around the outside of Minnesota. And the external quarantine is for firewood. So that is restricting the movement of firewood from other areas into the state of Minnesota, including our northern Canadian international border and then all of our surrounding states. So those are the two types of quarantines we have on these things. Um, when, you know, he kind of talked about this map and our quarantine map that's online and you are free to go to that, punch in your address and see exactly where you are in reference to any of these infestations. And I'm going to talk about a little bit again to just looking at that in that red area. 
when we say regulated articles, uh, don't move ash um, is kind of the top one that everyone is, but what does it actually mean and include? So all parts of an ash tree, um, all the actual insect, the emerald ash borer, all of our mulch because mulch gets mixed with a lot of species as well. And then hardwood, firewood. And firewood is anything that is less than four feet in length is considered firewood. So all those things are regulated and cannot leave a quarantine without what we call a compliance agreement from the Department of Agriculture, which is basically an agreement between you as a business, me as Department of Ag, and we agree that any kind of movement you're going to do with any of those articles um, are going to be treated in a method that is going to destroy, um, mitigate emerald ash borer from spreading. You wanna to flip to the next one. So again, here's just some visuals on what those regulated articles are, all parts of the ash tree, the logs, Got the pictures of mulch, some firewood. Um, those things are all regulated. So not just specifically ash firewood or specifically ash mulch. Um, again, those are both things that are mixed with different species. So the entirety is regulated under this quarantine as well. So when I talk about movement, it's always a big question. What can I do? What can I do? I like to sometimes look at it like a stop sign on our map, red is uh, you cannot leave any of that red area when you open up our, our quarantined map. Um, so it's kind of a stop, do not go. So we have those red arrow with uh, leaving Morrison County. You cannot do that without a compliance agreement. Um, however, if you see, look on the far southeastern part of that map on that image right there, it's green. So things can move within a quarantined area and within that red. And then just across the northland of Minnesota, there's also a green arrow and things outside of the quarantine can freely move as well. Uh, we have a yellow kind of definitely use with caution is if you had to move from a non-quarantined area to another, but you needed to transport across, that's a move with caution situation that you can only do with no stops besides general traffic or for fuel. So I kind of like that stop sign uh, method of looking at it. Red, do not pass go. You cannot leave that quarantine area without compliance agreement. However, you can move around within that, that quarantine in that area. Um, that's kind of just a quick snapshot of uh, trying to understand that movement again. Um, and again, here's a little bit zoomed in. This is the uh, Cass County, which is our last quarantine image on there. But we have arrows, that green one, the plus sign looking, yep, you can move around in a quarantine area. And things, again, can move into a quarantine. But once you move, if you move firewood into a quarantined area, then it's regulated and it cannot move back out because it's considered a regulated article. And those red ones just moving out, no mulch, no firewood, no parts of ash, um, all of those are regulated and cannot move out, again, without a compliance agreement. Um, if you go to that map, you can punch your address in and it'll zoom you right into where those, um, those fines are too. This is a quick image of a compliance agreement as well. This is something that you would sign if you are interested in moving any of those articles mentioned out of that quarantined area. There's two different things that are gonna allow movement. We have a certified safe to move. That is all treatment of potential emerald ash borer is going to occur on site within that area. And then there is that limited and that is untreated material. That means it's going somewhere that's going to fully treat uh, to destroy any potential emerald dash bar. So those are things that you would get through an agreement with the Department of Ag. And I'm happy to answer any of those questions um, if that you think it might pertain to you or yes, you need that to uh, facilitate your business. Happy to answer all of that and work through that process as well. Um, here are some of those options to ensure that we are mitigating and treating. We have a, a grind, a chip and a grind. You need to make it to a small size, less than one by one, two dimensionally. Debarking logs is also an option. Composting ash material. Heat treatment we do for firewood. Those are certified kiln producers. Um, there's some lumber and then fumigation as well. So those are all options we could discuss if you um, think that's something that you may be needing for your business or a municipality as well. So um, one of those things is firewood and I'm often asked, um, but I have oak, so that's not ash, that's not regulated. Um, actually it is under the definition of firewood. Firewood is hardwood that's less than four feet in length, split or not, commercial and personal, and it's all species. So any piece of wood that is 
um, less than four feet in length coming out of those areas, it is considered firewood. That's because firewood is co-mingled, starts to lose bark. It's hard to identify once that bark starts to come off. So it would be easy to mix in and have accidental ash. So that's why that definition is all hardwood that's less than four feet in length because often firewood is bundled. So all firewood is regulated within that area. And top conversation also I have is often is firewood movement. Again, I kind of mentioned these things, what firewood can and can't do, can't enter from other states because of that exterior quarantine. It can't leave the EAB quarantine. And then also um, it can't leave the spongy moth quarantine, which is a whole nother pest, but that's Lake in Cook County, Minnesota as well. Um, what firewood can do, move around inside that pest quarantine, which is those red areas on the map, move around outside the quarantine areas, not in that red color. And then there's that certified safe to move. So if you are looking to purchase firewood for recreational use, personal use, um, those bundles you can find at our gas stations and other large retail locations. Uh, we have 14 certified producers in Minnesota, and that's that heat treated safe to move firewood, and that's allowed to go anywhere. And always we kind of push that message, um, you know, buy local, buy it where you're going to burn it. Please just don't move firewood any kind of far distance in general. It's always a good practice to do that locally. And I know we'll have some other slides uh, kind of driving that point home too on firewood. Um, there is my contact information. Please feel free to shoot me an email or give me a call. I'd be happy to have a conversation about um, compliance if you need to or have other questions about those regulations. Thanks for logging in today. Great. Thank you, Danielle. Yeah. So, yeah, just like she mentioned, we're going to just kind of drive the point here. Um, firewood is uh, one of the main ways uh, invasive species get spread long distances. Um, so here's just a piece of ash wood with the bark on. There's no outward symptoms on the bark that let you know there's anything under there. Peel the bark back. You find an emerald ash borer gallery. Still no insect, um, but you dig in and there it is hidden about a quarter an inch underneath sapwood um, ready to pupate and emerge at a new location. So this is really why we have the um, don't move firewood uh, campaign just to um, you know buy it or you're going to burn it um, so you're not moving past long distances and, and killing trees uh, faster than they need to be. So um, now we're just going to touch on management. So there's a couple options for dealing with the insect. Um, We'll start with the best management practices. So uh, really, we try to uh, get people to not do work on ash uh, during the emerald ash borer active period. So when the adult insect, the beetle is flying around. So if you can, please try to avoid doing uh, you know, trimming and removals uh, from May 1st through September 30th. That's when that, that adult beetle is actively flying around. Um, and we, we say this for a couple of reasons, and that's due to the fact that a lot of times emerald ash borer will reinfest the same tree or, or the, the tree right next to it. A lot of, you know, the majority of the insects don't go long distance dispersal. So many of them will reinfest a tree within 100 meters uh, of where it emerged from. So you don't want to be um, removing a tree in the summertime when you have beetles up in the canopy that would potentially reinfest that same tree and then push them out to new trees uh, faster kind of uh, quickening that spread of the insect. So you want them to potentially lay, relay their eggs on that same infested tree and then be able to remove it in the in, during the dormant period and destroy that material um, before you reach the next flight season. Obviously, there's things like storms and, and hazard trees that need to be, need to be deal with, dealt with. Excuse me. Um, so if you do have to do work on ash trees, uh, especially in a known infested area, um, please, you know, if you can leave the material on site or chip it before you move it, or at the very least, uh, cover the load um, that you're going to be hauling uh, to the location where it's going to be processed. Um, and then obviously, you know, during the emerald ash borer dormant period, that's the best time to do that, that pruning and removal of ash. Uh, it also gives you an opportunity to, to destroy that material, whether it's through chipping or burning. Um, things like that uh, before the next flight season so you can kill um, the most amount of emerald ash borer um, from that, that area. So um, when it comes to dealing with emerald ash borer, the main options are you know, removals or treatments. So uh, with removals, you can, uh, you know, if you're a community looking at needing to manage emerald ash borer, so 
You may want to start removing uh, poor condition ash trees before you're known to have emerald ash borne in your community. So start reducing that ash resource throughout town. Um, you uh, can have a monitoring program where you're identifying trees that show woodpecker damage. So they show signs of infestation. So making sure those get removed during the winter time and targeting those trees specifically. And obviously uh, you're gonna be needing to remove dead trees that are in areas that uh, if they die and fall apart, uh, they, they are a hazard and could potentially damage uh, you know, uh, property or, or human health. So um, those are kind of the options for removals. And then you have insecticide treatments, which are preventative and therapeutic. So you can treat an ash tree before emerald ash borer is known to be there. Um, so as long as that tree is a healthy tree, so in general, no more than 30% canopy decline is is kind of the the cutoff for whether a tree is worth uh, treating or not and can uptake that chemical to fully protect it. Um, and so if you do find it early, so if you're paying attention for the symptoms of, of emerald ash borer, where you notice a little bit of woodpecker damage in that upper canopy, um, if that canopy is still healthy, uh, you can still treat the tree after it's lightly infested. So those are the two options for dealing with emerald ash borer. And so other things you want to think about when you're deciding what's best to do um, is how how close is emerald ash borer known to be? Um, is it in your county? Is it known to be in your town? Um, you know, is it in your head? Have, have you seen symptoms in your neighborhood? Uh, how healthy is your tree? So is the tree in good condition in general? Um, does it have a nice full canopy or is it, uh, you know, in general in decline or kind of past that point where it might not be worth investing in the treatments? You know, how large is the tree? Is, is it a large mature tree that's giving you lots of benefits? Or is it a smaller tree that would be pretty easy to cut down and replace and get something growing in its place that won't be impacted by the insect? And then obviously, how many trees do you have to deal with? So if you're a community, um, if you're managing trees for a city or, or a park system or something like that, uh, having an ash inventory is really key because um, it's hard to know what you need to do if you don't know what the resource is out there. So um, really having an ash inventory uh, and doing some planning around that is really key to identifying what you're going to have to deal with. And uh, it will really help you prioritize uh, what, you, what you deal with first. So, um, you know, in general, uh, treatments can be a great option if you have a large number of ash trees that you have to manage. Um, as it can help slow the rate at which you have to do removals. So you may not plan to treat the tree for the life of the tree, but it may uh, allow you to um, stage the, the removals that you have to deal with on public property over a longer period of time. So you don't have a bunch of dead and hazardous trees uh, lining the streets or, or parks um, in a short amount of time. So with Emerald Ash Borer, with that, that population explosion, you know, you have a lot of trees dying in a short amount of time. Um, treating a number of trees throughout town is, is definitely a good option for helping to slow the rate at which you have to do removals and things like that. Um, and then also it's good to mention that, you know, a large mature ash tree gives off lots of benefits. If you have one located in your yard that gives you lots of, of shade, uh, increases your property value, things like that, um, you know, you may be able to treat that tree for over 20 years before you ever reach that cost of what it would be to remove that tree up front. So depending on the situation, it can be the more affordable approach. Um, so you really, those are all things you have to take into account when you're deciding whether it's worth treating the tree or if you're planning to remove it in general. But really just remember that, you know, ash trees become hazardous quickly after they die. So you really don't want to wait to decide on what to do with that tree until it dies. So you want to deal with it before it's completely dead. Uh, mentioning the insecticides, there's a number, number of different insecticide options for treating your ash trees that are effective. So as long as that tree is healthy enough and the insecticides are applied properly, uh, it will protect uh, your tree from emerald ash borer. Just remember, it's not a one and done thing. Uh, the treatments have to be reapplied. So depending on the type of treatment that you use, it either has to be uh, reapplied every year or uh, for the uh, emamectin benzoate chemical, uh, it is every two or three years. So uh, in general, per the label, it's every two years for the those trunk that trunk injection method um, to keep your tree protected. If you're a city um, managing a lot more trees, uh, you may think about doing a third year rotation where you do get a good amount of protection in that third year 
but you know, in really high pest pressure situations, you may get some damage in that third year if you don't retreat. But uh, if you're dealing with a large number of trees, it's, you can make your money go a lot further if you have a, a three-year rotation as opposed to a two-year rotation. Uh, so it's just important to measure uh, and make sure you know what you're dealing with. Uh, always look at the label on, on the uh, insecticide that you choose. It's important to look to make sure that uh, whatever you choose is labeled for a tree that size or larger. Oftentimes, uh, some of the soil drenches you can buy as a homeowner may not be labeled for uh, treating trees that are, you know, 15 inches and higher in diameter. So really, once you get to, into those large mature trees, uh, we highly suggest having a professional treat the tree so you know that it's uh, being applied properly and you're not you're not wasting money or uh, put, wasting chemical going into the ground. So. Uh, really, uh, check out our homeowner's guide for insecticide selection. It lays out all the different options. If you have a large mature tree uh, that you want to protect and keep around, uh, we highly suggest uh, seeking out an arborist and that is a licensed uh, pesticide applicator um, to have your tree treated. In general, uh, I think the, the average cost for homeowners is kind of close to about $10 a diameter inch. So if you're a homeowner treating your tree every two years and you have a 15 inch diameter tree, it's gonna be about 150 bucks every couple of years. So um, like I mentioned, you know, depending on where that tree is in your yard and uh, how much shade you're getting from it, that, that may be well worth the investment. Um, and then I know in communities that, uh, you know, that are managing a large number of trees, if they invest in the equipment to do the, the injections themselves, um, that that price can drop a fair bit um, down closer to around the, the five or six dollars a diameter inch. So if you have questions, please uh, let us know, but uh, check out the homeowner's guide to insecticide selection if, if you want to learn more about uh, insecticide options. All right, and then just lastly, uh, management priorities. They, they change as you go from an uninfested area to a high, heavily infested area. So uh, really the important thing uh, when you're in a not known to be infested area is uh, we're doing early detection and reporting infestations as quickly as possible. And then really the key is planning uh, and inventory. So getting an inventory of the tree, ash trees that you have in town and coming up with an ML ash for management plan. So we have a nice um, handy guide that uh, is written in plain language that's available on our website. So it's a guidelines to slow the growth and spread of emerald ash borer. Uh, kind of walks you through all the different options of, of your planning and management of emerald ash borer once it's found in your community. And then next, you know, as you become a generally infested area, you want to treat high value trees. Uh, you want to remove trees in a timely fashion. Uh, so the trees, you want to come up with a plan, uh, especially if you're city managing this, to, to keep up with removals because eventually once that population explodes, uh, it's probably going to overwhelm your capacity and you're going to have a lot more dead and hazardous trees uh, than you have the ability to deal with in a given year. And then as you know, Emerald Ash Borer continues to work your way through your community, just try to minimize wood movement and you know, utilize the wood in whatever way you can and, and dispose of it safely. All right, and so lastly, just touching on reporting. So um, now that you know what to look for, please let us know if you think you found Emerald Ash Borer in a new location. Um, take pictures if you can. Those are the, the best for us to look at. So um, try to get close up pictures of the symptoms that you're seeing. So if it's woodpecker damage, the insect galleries, uh, the insect itself, try to take up um, close detailed pictures. Just a zoomed out picture of a crappy looking ash tree um, is kind of hard to tell what's going on through that. So we really need to see pictures of those symptoms. Um, and then uh, the best way to report is if you have a city forester, um, you can use uh, EdMaps program, which is really nice because it uh, you can that report goes directly to my email inbox. Otherwise, you can use MDA's report a pest form. There's an online form, uh, there's an email, or there's a voicemail. So any of those ways, and we'll we'll get the report, and we can follow up on it with you or with whoever's best to follow up with. And um, please, as you're out there moving around the state, um, keep your eyes out and, and let us know if you see anything worth checking out. And thanks again for joining us today. Uh, now we can answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and here's our contact information. If if you think of something later on and want to follow up with us, um, I will post a link to this recorded uh, presentation and uh, later on today. And so if you know of anybody that wasn't able to attend that would benefit from this, please let them know and tell them to check out our website for a, for a viewing link. Thank you.
All right. Well, yeah. Thanks again for for uh, attending this morning. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to our contact information. Looks like someone is typing a question or typing. All right, Danielle, there's a question for you. Yeah, I see that. Yes, so non-ash saw logs can be moved because typically they are longer than eight feet or eight feet in length. So those can be moved without any kind of compliance agreement. If you need to move ash saw logs, they need to go somewhere that has a compliance agreement or somewhere that is located within the quarantined area. But otherwise, your question specifically, non-ash can move, yes. Waiting as we see someone else's typing. <laughs> Anticipation. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, Tim, please email me the coordinates. We're going to be up in Little Falls next Tuesday and we can check those out. It'd be great to be able to follow up on it at that time. Thank you. <laughs> And at any time, if you see it anywhere else, please, you can follow up with our reporting stuff. Uh, yeah. If you're in another county as well, as uh, we mentioned on that reporter pest or emailing us pictures like that, we appreciate that. Yeah, if it's easiest just to send me an email, please do. Um, 